Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen from uh, Paris, France. Uh, I'm Marc Landau. I am a clinical education manager for uh, EcoSense Paris. And I'm uh, very glad tonight to welcome uh, all uh, our participants to this uh, second webinar we have this year. Tonight uh, we will speak about the, the clinical utility of FibroScan and Fibrometer in uh, alcoholic uh, liver disease. And I have the pleasure to introduce you with our two experts in the field of alcoholic liver disease. We have uh, Professor uh, Ramon Bataler uh, from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in, in the United States. Hello. Welcome. And we have uh, Sebastian Müller from uh, University of Heidelberg in Germany. Hello, thank nice you. Uh, thank you both for coming. So tonight we will, uh, we will divide our webinar in three parts. First, uh, our experts will uh, share with us the results of the published literature hein, for everybody to understand the use of FibroScan and uh, Fibrometer to manage patients uh, with alcoholic liver disease. Then we'll have a, a, part, a second part with a few clinical cases uh, taken from your daily practice. And in a third part, we'll have an interactive uh, question and answer session, as we do uh, quite often. Uh, and you are highly encouraged to send your questions. We have a moderated chat. You can send some questions uh, on the web page. And we will try, uh, of course, to answer this question at the end of the, of the webinar. So uh, I suggest now it's time for me to give the floor to our experts. <coughs> and, uh, and I give you the, we can start now. Thank you. So, <coughs> thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar in life and the people that will see that later on. Well, we will talk <coughs> about three aspects of alcoholic liver disease. The number one is the prevalence. How prevalent is this disease? Number second, how can we diagnose clinically and with other methods this disease? And particularly, we will focus in the utility of fibro, uh, fibroscan and, and uh, fibrometer. So let's talk about first the prevalence. When we talk about the prevalence of a disease, we have to talk about moderate compensated liver disease, but also about cirrhosis. What about moderate liver disease? This is a very nice study published uh, several years ago for France showing the prevalence of uh, fibrosis in the general population. And you, as you can see, fibrosis was present in 7% of the patients that were uh, assessed. And the vast majority of patients have fibrosis because fatty liver disease is both NAFLD and ALD. NAFLD accounted for two-thirds of the causes of fibrosis in fully compensated asymptomatic patients, and ALD alcohol for one-third. But interestingly, in one-third of the cases, patients could have liver fibrosis due to both NAFLD and ALD together. So no question that NAFLD and ALD are a major cause of moderate liver disease. What about cirrhosis? Well, here the data is, I think, overwhelming. The World Health Organization released recently a very detailed report showing that roughly 50%, half of the, pa of the patients with cirrhosis worldwide were due to alcohol abuse. And if we, we see the USA and Canada, for example, and Europe, more than 60% of the patients with cirrhosis were due to alcohol. So there is no question that alcohol is one of the major, if not the main cause of cirrhosis worldwide. What about the natural history? Uh, how can we diagnose a patient with alcoholic liver disease? Well, the natural history is well known, and I will go quickly uh, through that. But I will give you two or three important um, highlights, in my opinion. When people abuse an alcohol for a long time, most of them develop some degree of steatosis, of fat accumulation in the liver. And if you continue drinking with steatosis and ash, I will show you, you, you develop fibrosis. And alcohol is a very fibrogenic disease, much more than NAFLD. Then if the fibrosis progresses, you will develop cirrhosis, HCC, or the compensations, who are the main causes of death in these patients. When, as I say, to develop fibrosis, you, you need to develop some degree of alcoholic steatopatitis. But in, in the field of alcohol, there is another syndrome call alcoholic hepatitis, that is a super acute deterioration of the liver function in heavy drinkers. Some of them were not cirrhotics, but most of them have cirrhosis underlying. And this syndrome doesn't exist for NAFLD and is typical 
of alcoholic liver disease. What happens in this disease compared to other diseases? That in most, the most majority of alcoholic liver disease patients are captured too late when they are jaundiced, when they are decompensated. We have to, ma to make so much more efforts to identify these patients early. And as we will point out during this presentation, the use of non-invasive markers like FibroScan, FibroMeter, et cetera, could really help in the identification of early silent alcoholic liver disease. Well, why is it important to detect fibrosis in these patients? I think the data, although it's a scarce, we need more studies, the results are overwhelming. Let's see the left panel. In the left panel, they show the long-term follow-up, the survival after 15 or 10 years of follow-up of patients with alcoholic liver disease, depending on the degree of fibrosis measured by fibro tests. And you can see the lower part of this curve are patients with advanced fibrosis F3 and F4, and look at the significant decrease in the survival of these patients. They really die 40% in 10 years. So detecting fibrosis in these patients is really important. And more recent data for Caroline Lagnick and, and, and her group in, in Austria, they corroborated these results, but this time by biopsy. They did biopsies on patients with early silent liver disease due to alcohol. And they found that those patients have an F3, F4, it means advanced fibrosis, they really have a very significant mortality over the years. So no question about that, that detecting advanced fibrosis in these patients could be really helpful because, for example, we can encourage the patients to stop drinking. We also did a multi-centric study showing that in those patients with alcoholic hepatitis that I mentioned to you before, the presence of cirrhosis or the presence of advanced fibrosis is also a key determinant of survival. This is a scoring system that we developed only using histological criteria. And if you have cirrhosis underlying an alcoholic hepatitis, you, your um, prognosis is much worse. So in conclusion, having fibrosis at a severe stage, F3, F4, convey a very bad prognosis or bad, worse prognosis in patients with alcoholic liver disease. So we really have to diagnose those patients early. Well, how can we diagnose a patient with alcoholic liver disease? There are different stages, and this is a slide from my colleague, Sebastian, that I like very much. So liver is, and in the top part, you have the liver stages, fatty liver disease, esteotopatitis, cirrhosis. And then in the left, in the, uh, in the vertical panel, you see the different tests. Typically, patients with silent liver disease due to alcohol have abuse of alcohol. Sometimes they report, sometimes they under-report, so you need some tests. And you can see the GOT is higher than the GPT, GGT is elevated, and we have some markers of alcoholic abuse like HG or CDT. There are some markers that are present in people who have drunk in the last days. Okay. Also, you can do some other laboratory tests, serum markers of liver disease. Of course, an ultrasound is always um, um, advised in these patients to rule out cirrhosis, HCC, etc. And also liver stiffness, I think, is being used more and more in this patient population. Of course, there are other, other tools that we can use, alpha fetoprotein in patients with cirrhosis, endoscopy to rule out viruses, and CAP also to detect steatosis in these patients. Well, if we go back a little bit to the um, natural history, we will agree that the key here is how can we, how can we identify these patients with a silent and symptomatic compensated cirrhosis due to alcohol. They are patients walking in the street, they are working normally, they don't have symptoms, but they don't have a cirrhosis. We need to identify those patients. Well, which methods we have to do this task? The number one is liver biopsy. But traditionally, people with, or patients with alcoholic liver disease and they want liver biopsy much less often than people, for example, with nephilim for different reasons. It's a self-inflicted disease, the lack of insurance, poor compliance on some of the patients, but also poor attention to this disease. We need to study more this disease. We need to, de to do more studies. But liver biopsy obviously is not an ideal gold standard for fibrosis. Why? Because it's an invasive procedure. You can have morbidity and in very few cases mortality. You need hospitalization in many cases. There also inter or server error but importantly, sampling error. Depending, you see the arrows there, where the needle goes to the liver, you can under or overestimate the degree of fibrosis. So 
Besides this invasive method, we have other not invasive methods like stiffness, liver stiffness with FibroScan or serum markers. And I will pass now to my colleague Sebastian Muller. To, this is an expert in FibroScan in this disease. Sebastian, please. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you very much uh, for introducing us here to the uh, natural history and epidemiology of alcoholic liver disease. So before I start, um, let me briefly give you my uh, background. I'm sorry, I have to move forward. Uh, so I'm going now, or I'm taking over now the liver stiffness issue, as Ramon mentioned, um, that I consider personally as a revolution in the diagnosis of uh, liver diseases. And um, uh, we, I personally have experience with the FibroScan that was the first uh, device and technology introduced um, now for 10 years. And um, uh, besides seeing uh, patients with liver diseases, um, we also see many patients uh, did just have internal medicine diseases, which I consider very important because it has educated us in many confounders of elevated stiffness. And second, we see about 600 patients undergoing alcohol detoxification at our unit. And that is very important to know because most of these patients are not per se primarily sick. Um, and in fact, 60% of them have no liver disease. So we know a little bit from these patients um, uh, uh, from, a, if you want, a normal uh, population. Now, um, I, I learned from, from Mark that most of the participants today um, are already familiar with the FibroScan and elastographic techniques. So I will briefly go through the basics of the technology. I will then uh, tell you and share with you some of our and publish data on the, the basis of uh, uh, liver stiffness. And we then will have time to really go into the algorithms, how to really make the diagnosis using the device in alcoholics or uh, in patients that uh, drink alcohol. Um, now, uh, you all know that um, uh, the FibroScan is based on a sophisticated ultrasound uh, technology that uh, uh, allows uh, it to, the, to measure, in fact, the stiffness of tissues. It is done by exerting a, an ultrasound wave, a shear wave, and uh, the, the speed of the shear wave is measured by a co-integrated sensor. And uh, this uh, shear wave depends, as you see in the second point, on uh, the, uh, as we call it, uh, in, 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 in body physics, a Young's elastic module and the, on, on the characteristics of the tissue, and it's expressed in a pressure unit in Pascal. And, and uh, many studies, over 500, have now clearly shown that the scar fibrotic tissues become stiffer, and, uh, and there's a fantastic correlation between this measured liver stiffness and um, and the fibrosis stage, the histology fib fibrosis stage. The technology is called and patented vibration control transient elastography. Um, what is very important, and that has been appreciated very early on, it's a very rapid technology. Within five minutes, you have uh, the data. It's, of course, painless, and it's a quantitative measurement. Um, and it gives you a range between 1.5 and 75 kilopascal, um, uh, below 6 kilopascal, it's generally considered now to be normal. And it measures, and it is also very important, um, uh, about a fingertip of, of the, the liver volume. It can be, of course, measured on different sides. And uh, this means it is more than 100 times bigger than the the, the biopsy volume that we usually obtain if we perform a liver biopsy, which means we have a painless, rapid, non-invasive technology that gives us a better sampling error, 10 times better sampling error than our gold standard. And uh, as a pe personal note, I should also add, uh, we usually have the results um, much earlier than we even have our lab tests. So it's a very rapid uh, 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 information that you have. Um, now on a 
very brief note, I just want to mention another parameter that is now available for quite some time and that is also obtained with the Fibrosyn device and based actually on the shear wave technology. It's uh, the so-called controlled attenuation parameter cap. It actually measures the, the attenuation of the ultrasound energy over the time and uh, first uh, data that are not yet as abundant as the stiffness values are very encouraging. They show very nice correlation with hepatic steatosis. It's in fact better than the, the daily uh, normal routine ultrasound. Uh, and if we have time at the end we may deliver some more data on that. Uh, and in fact the data on alcoholic liver disease, the topic of the today's webinar are still a little bit scare. So I will leave it with them. Um, the, the units are indicated as decibel per meter. So you see it's an acoustic unit in fact. So I, I'm going to start now to introduce you to the first data uh, obtained on Fibroscan uh, and uh, alcoholic liver disease. Now I would like to start with a, a now classical French study by Dr. Nguyen Kak who um, compared in more than 200 patients, all biopsy proven, uh, serum markers and the fibroscan. And uh, what you see, it's a very easy answer of this uh, high quality performed study. Uh, you see that all fibrosis stages, in all fibrosis stages, the fibroscan uh, was superior of the serum markers. I personally think that this is not really of surprise because the fibrous skin here, of course, is really addressing the liver, while, of course, serum markers um, can first be uh, modulated by other tissues in our body. And, uh, of course, they reflect moreover a turnover instead of a, if you want, a count uh, uh, balance as a fibrous skin device is doing. Um, now, already without applying any sophisticated algorithm, we know from these studies, and there have been some more, uh, that uh, such a direct measurement of stiffness is already better uh, than a zero marker. What we have also learned, and I cite here the first meta-analysis, but there are many other data now, uh, those are the quite, uh, I would say, accepted general uh, cut-off values uh, in all studies that have been compared with uh, biopsies. And you see that uh, a soft liver below 6 kilopascal in fact rules out uh, uh, even mild fibrosis. Um, the uh, cutoff value for a 4 cirrhosis starts with 12.5 kilopascal, F3 with 8. And there is what we call a gray range between 6 and 8 kilopascal. And I will come to this in a minute. What I would like to mention on the slide, uh, and we should be aware of, uh, if you remember the time before uh, elastography, we had four stages, or in other scores you have maybe six uh, uh, stages. But now we have within the uh, fourth stage a huge and long bandwidth from 12 to 75 kilopascal, which opens up a complete new world, in fact, and we are still learning here. Um, um, I'm now moving to something that we learned quite early on um, when the first studies, and I cite here the first three biopsy proven studies on ALD, purely on ALD. It's not complete the list, uh, there's now some few studies more. Um, and I want to uh, pinpoint you to uh, the cutoff values for a four. What you see is, and what we learned quite quickly, that the cutoff values really were higher than in the established uh, uh, studies on viral habit hepatitis and they varied. So you see it ranged from 11.5 to tw almost 26 kilopascal. And that has left uh, many colleagues with some confusions and I hope I can, can answer in the next few minutes uh, some of these uh, uh, questions that arise. Now, this is just very short and to, to underline a little bit what, what Ramon already mentioned. Um, 
Uh, ALD is an underdiagnosed disease and it has to do with many, many issues. Um, but one thing is, of course, that the liver is uh, painless usually. And uh, we have performed here at our department a non published study yet where we try to show you if you compare the ability of the conventional approaches, ultrasound and lab tests, to identify child A cirrhosis, you will miss uh, half of them. Uh, and if you do the fibro scan, you will see all of them. Um, in fact, and I, we don't discuss it here in more detail, the fibro scan is fantastic with uh, more than 96% in ruling out, in fact, an ongoing liver disease. That makes it so important as a screening uh, tool. Um, it is, it is how, however, less specific when you have an elevated liver stiffness. And that is exactly what uh, I showed you just when I showed the different cutoff values. And in one slide, I, I try to summarize up uh, many years of work now of the last years that, that sum up in an important finding. Uh, it, it just shows if you look on the left, you see fibrosis stage, of course, affects liver stiffness. However, we have learned that many others important confounders, and those are confounders that, of course, can also occur in patients with alcoholic liver disease, that these confounders are also able to elevate and increase liver stiffness. And you see here very new data, arterial pressure can do it, uh, very drastically can be increased uh, by central venous pressure, and you know heart patients with heart failure, this is not a rare disease, it's very popular and you have to, t to take it into consideration. Cholestasis, mechanic cholestasis, alcohol uh, uh, consumption itself and food intake and very importantly inflammation. And um, if you uh, focus on the, on the, on the right uh, confounders and you look closer you will realize that in fact all these confounders are pressure associated confounders and we, we believe increasingly that the sinusoidal pressure is very important for elevating the stiffness. So uh, highlighted here is the inflammation because that is the most uh, challenging issue in daily practice. Um, of course alcoholic steatohepatitis elevates uh, stiffness and how can we cope with this uh, issue and dissect this fibrosis stage from the inflammation related increase of stiffness. So in the next slide I briefly want to answer this. Um, there is according to our experience two uh, strategies. Uh, you can either consider an intervention with your patient or uh, we have proposed uh, uh, inflammation adapted cutoff values. Um, uh, I want to sum up the first study we performed on this issue. In, in one slide here, um, what we did here, this was a study with over 100 patients, but I show you one peculiar patient with quite pronounced steatohepatitis undergoing alcohol detoxification at our unit. And what you see in the upper panel, that the quite high, that you, you don't see this very often, uh, transaminase levels, GOT over 400, decreased over uh, 10 days. But what you see in the lower panel is that the stiffness uh, decreases over the time. And I hope uh, I can convincingly show you that by doing such an intervention of alcohol detoxification, you can unmask the, um, the fibrosis related uh, stiffness from the inflammation related stiffness. And that's uh, why we, it, in fact, if it's possible, uh, we do this. And, and if you do that, you get a much better correlation of your stiffness with the fibrosis stage. And in fact, this has been confirmed now by other uh, groups and together with Dr. Trabu from France, we are preparing a publication on, on more than 400 patients. And what I'm showing you here is simply, if you focus on the, on the ordinate, what you see here in the slide is the number of patients and the change of liver stiffness after alcohol detoxification. So if you look, if you focus on the left, you will see, for instance, 10% of, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, if, if you focus on the, on the right, 40% of the uh, uh, of stiffness is decreased in 10% of the patients 
but in, in the majority of patients, the liver stiffness is uh, decreased by 10%. Of course, you have a variability there, but uh, for about 27%, you will have to correct the fibrosis stage after alcohol detoxification. And there is a nice um, small study by an addiction, done, performed by an addiction center in France, and I briefly want to mention it. Also the opposite has been shown. So relapsers of, of drinkers that actually underwent an uh, addiction program, um, and you will see it here after two months, they showed an increase of elevated stiffness. So. Um, Liver stiffness is really nicely uh, following up the alcohol levels and this uh, led uh, me and Laurent Sandrin uh, to formulate an algorithm that we still practice uh, in our unit today um, that uh, if you uh, measure the stiffness of a patient and the stiffness is normal, you really rule out uh, uh, chronic liver disease. Um, it has a powerful uh, negative predictive value. If you have elevated liver stiffness, you really should uh, consider an intervention. Um, I mentioned uh, alcohol detoxification. When your GOT levels are below 100, uh, you can directly go to the established cutoff values and uh, uh, and one I, I didn't mention before is the 20 kilopascal, also very importantly, and I would like to refer to the webinar of last year given by uh, Drs. Pinsani and uh, Berigotti, uh, that with 20 kilopascal you really have to check for esophageal varices and uh, hepatocellular cancer. Um, I will now briefly mention in, in, the, in the final minutes I have the other approach. Are we able to assess directly fibrosis stage in an optimized manner if we know the degree of inflammation and um, the liver stiffness, from the liver stiffness? And I would like to draw your attention to a recent uh, multicenter study uh, with more than 2,000 um, uh, biopsied patients, both with HCV and alcoholic liver disease and the study sign was that we really had all the biopsies, the liver stiffness within two weeks, the laboratory tests and what we then did, we tried to identify the easily available parameter <coughs> that best reflects the inflammation in these patients and then we tried by reiterating rock analysis uh, uh, GOT adapted cutoff values. And um, I would like to go very briefly on this very busy slide. It just uh, tells you that in, indeed GOT, both in both diseases, uh, was best correlated with liver stiffness. And um, uh, what it also tells you quite interestingly that uh, the pattern of GOT, uh, so we div div divided uh, the, the patients in four different GOT groups according to their level, less than 50 up to more than 200. And you see really according to the fibrosis stage, uh, there's a very different pattern between HCV and ALD. So with HCV you really see a continuous increase of the GOT levels, with ALD it's different. Um, and that all needs to be taken into account. And now this is the major finding. What we saw is in fact that um, if you have an elevated GOT in your patients, you see an increase of the cutoff values. Here shown for a 3 versus a 4. And what you see is two information. First of all, it's an exponential increase, quite interestingly. And second, there's a huge difference between HCV and ALD. So ALD uh, patients respond much stronger with the, an elevation of stiffness than HCV patients. And um, this is in fact the sum up slides of the study uh, and I think uh, it's quite easy to handle in daily practice. What you see is the, uh, uh, the cutoff values adapted for GOT levels and on the left side you see alcoholic liver disease and you can now really go with your patient with the measured stiffness in a GOT level to this working diagram and identify the uh, the fibrosis stage. Uh, I did not mention that we could also show in the study that in fact um, it improved fibrosis stage 
And what I show you here is the aurochs. And you may see, also it's quite busy, that indeed if you apply this algorithm, you improve the aurochs, the diagnostic accuracy of the whole algorithm. Um, I would like to sum up with a, again, busy slide, but it's an algorithm that we developed and that we use daily in our unit. Um, it refers a little bit also to the initiation uh, uh, graph that Ramon showed. So, of course, if you have uh, a patient who you suspect alcoholic liver disease, you take the full panel of easily available information, uh, of course, and if you identify in your ultrasound measurements uh, direct uh, and, and sure signs of cirrhosis, of course, you have made the diagnosis. But then, of course, we do uh, the fibroscan. And uh, we have done before the ultrasound in our unit, and so we have excluded uh, congestion, we have excluded nodules, cancer, and cholestasis. And then uh, we, uh, as you see here, have these uh, values for stiffness. If you have higher than 30 kilopascal, mm -hmm. you are sure this patient has cirrhosis. If you have uh, less than 6 kilopascal, you exclude any manifest fibrosis. This patient has not any consequences from his drinking. And if you have the uh, values in between, you have then to apply the GOT adapted cutoff values that I mentioned earlier on. And um, I'm now uh, going to hand over the talk again to Ramon because I mentioned here what do you do? And we have it sometimes in 5%. What is if we cannot measure uh, uh, liver stiffness in these patients? And uh, we were not able to do this. Uh, before maybe I hand over, so the sum up is, I think liver stiffness is really the non-invasive novel follow-up parameter to assess alcoholic fibrosis. Consider level of GOT and ultrasound, consider the clinical context, and consider interventions. And liver stiffness, and that we should keep always in mind, reflects not only the fibrosis stage, but also the sinusoidal pressure by many other conditions. I would now like to hand over to Ramon. Thank you so much, Sebastian. So, well, Sebastian mentioned no everything relies in Fabroscan. What about if your clinic doesn't have the policy of they can afford, they cannot afford a Fabroscan, or, or you prefer serum markers? So I mentioned serum markers in the blood, although they are not optimal, but they also can be very, very good assessing non-invasively liver fibrosis also in alcoholic patients. And EcoSense now is marketing the fibrometer. Fibrometer basically is a, is a group, is a, <clears throat> there are different blood tests that put together and analyze together that can assess not invasively liver fibrosis in the patients. You have to choose which fibrometer algorithm you use for viral hepatitis or BOC, for NAFLD or for alcohol, because each of the causes of liver disease has a different algorithm. When you think alcohol is the main driver of fibrosis in the patient, choose please the algorithm for alcohol. And this algorithm, as you can see here in the upper part of the slide, has four parameters. Alpha-2 macroglobulin, hyaluronic acid, protombin index, and platelets. And this is the, in the lower part is the measurement, the estimation of liver fibrosis that the algorithm the company will send you and your doctor will have to interpret. And how in the practical terms you do that? Well, once you, you and your doctor agree that you have to assess your level of liver fibrosis because you have an excessive drinking behavior, you have to order or prescribe a uh, fibrometer. Then you go to your laboratory or your hospital, your private clinic, whatever that is, uh, has a contract or has an uh, agreement with uh, EcoSense to do, the, do so. They take some blood from you. And then the doctor will send um, the data to an algorithm web-based, and they will get an assessment from F0 to S4 of your degree of fibrosis. So with caution, because as Sebastian very well explained, there are other parameters can influence these serum tests or non-invasive markers, you will have an interpretation of the results. And there's no much data, but there are three studies assessing fibrometer in the alcoholic liver disease. And you see in the, in the right panel in this little figure, Fibrometer is very good to detect F3 and F4 fibrosis that, I'm, as I mentioned before, that those that define advanced fibrosis 
And when you have F3 and F4 is when you are, are in a high risk of developing complications, even mortality in the next 10 years. So I think this is a fantastic new tool that Ecosense can also offer you to assess not invasively liver fibrosis. And I think after this um, uh, little uh, talk, we can go to clinical cases. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this very uh, insightful and uh, comprehensive lecture. So yes, this is the time now to move to the clinical case. So we have prepared a few clinical cases taken from your daily practice. So I guess it's time maybe to, to discuss this case. Okay. I will present Thank you. the clinical <coughs> cases and my colleague Sebastian will discuss them. And okay, the first clinical case is a 50 years is old, Caucasian. There's a significant wine and beer intake for 20 years or more. It's in good general status. The BMI is slightly elevated, normal blood pressure and heart rate. The GPT is 50, slightly elevated. GOT is more elevated, 70. GGT is elevated to 55. And the liver function tests are normal. Synthetic function tests are normal. Look at the ferritin, it's 541. Alcohol, besides hemochromatosis, is the number second cause of elevation of ferritin. And uh, all the hepatitis virus were negative. And I ask you, uh, uh, Sebastian, which tests would you perform in this patient? Yeah, so thank you. Now that is, if we look backwards, maybe more than 10 years ago, if we are honest, this is quite a typical patient, right? It's a, mm -hmm. uh, he has some features of some ferritin that could be linked to alcoholic liver disease, but otherwise not very impressing, right? So we would not really do a biopsy with, with him, I think. We would never do it. Today we would do a fiber scan, I think. We would do it. For sure we would do it in Heidelberg. And um, we did it. And what you see is, uh, I, I think that is sometimes surprising. It's 22.6 kilopascal. It's a very good measurement. IQR is excellent. Uh, below you see the, uh, the uh, ultrasound. You see the typical enlarged liver, in, in increased echo density, a little bit inhomogeneous, but no sure signs of cirrhosis. So you don't, uh, what I observe actually in practice is that many People then don't believe the fibroscan data. What does it mean? The spleen is, um, yeah, was here a little bit at the border, which is a problem sometimes. You know, you think, is it the portal hypertension or not? We don't know. So the question is really now, uh, this is cirrhosis actually. Is it cirrhosis? So in this case, would you perform a liver biopsy? I wouldn't do it anymore, <laughs> but we did it in this case. And, um, and in fact, um, the data you have believed me now, it was uh, confirmed uh, a four cirrhosis in this patient with typical features of uh, alcoholic liver disease. And um, uh, what, you, uh, what you see here is, um, I show you here this, this uh, working diagram from this multicenter trial of last year. And uh, maybe it's hard to see, but the red line pins to the to the value of liver stiffness from this patient. And you see it's even with the, with the, with the uh, 7, 70 uh, GOT, it is still for sure in the, fibro in the cirrhotic range. So this uh, patient has uh, for sure liver cirrhosis. We could have used the other approach that I mentioned, an intervention. And in fact, uh, we did and we remeasured uh, the patient and you see here uh, the GOT went down to 55 and the stiffness went to 16.1, still cirrhotics and unfortunately now it's missing but if you follow up it would be still, he would be still in the cirrhotic range. So, um, uh, and that is now the, the biopsy that I mentioned. So this is, to sum, to sum it up, um, it is uh, a patient with child A cirrhosis um, it's in this case histologically confirmed and it means it has really consequences for this patient now. It has, he needs to screen for varices, he needs to perform endoscopy, he needs to, to, to do the liver cancer screen, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, <coughs> I would follow up uh, now, also that is not in any guideline, but I would follow up the guy yearly to mm -hmm. see whether this stiffness increases. And I want to mention a couple things of the potential youthfulness of the fibroscan of of measurement in these patients. Number one, 
Many of these patients are given anti-craving drugs, antaboos, for example, which is a potential hepatotoxic. And in many cases, they don't assess for liver fibrosis, how severe is the liver disease. These patients with cirrhosis, given antaboos, could be dangerous. There is a reason. Another potential reason that is not evidence-based, but in my experience can be good, is to motivate the patient to stop drinking. Once the patient knows that has an organ affected and a potential cirrhosis, people respect the liver. They know that there is no dialysis for the liver. And this is a way to show the patients you don't have a pain, you don't have, you have any symptomatic disease, but if you continue drinking, you will have bad complications. And maybe in the future we'll have a studies assessing whether doing Fibroscan can influence people to stop drinking. But this is a a speculation, but interesting in my if opinion. If I can just add to that, because that's very interesting. Uh, first, I, I also have observed, I don't know the numbers exactly, but some patients really, they actually follow up the numbers and that motivates them. And the second thing is we performed in Heidelberg together with Mannheim a trial with Nalmifane, which is uh, uh, very interesting now because it's the first drug being approved for alcohol reduction therapy. And um, we have seen there a correlation. And you, uh, under the uh, uh, treatment over three months with, with nalmifane, and m m especially also for the psychiatrists, they are very uh, anxious when they apply drugs to their patients mm -hmm. uh, that they ha do harm to the liver. So it also helps you to see, no, there is no harm. Yeah. Good Let's go to the second case that is a 44-year-old male Hispanic. Also is a heavy drinker, beer and tequila for more than 25 years, in good condition. Remember that in an asymptomatic state, many people are in a very good condition despite having even a cirrhosis. BMI 25, normal blood pressure and a high rate. The GPT was normal, GOT mildly elevated, GGT also mildly elevated, normal synthetic function. Ferritin in this case was not so elevated, transfer saturation uh, normal and normal hepatitis B, well, negative hepatitis B and C. And again, uh, Sebastian, tell us what you will be uh, assessing this patient, please. Yes, so, so this patient um, is really uh, what we call, I mean, he's a heavy drinker, right? He's a heavy drinker. He um, is not obese. Um, he has no really signs of inflammation. Um, mm, the lab looks quite okay to us. So we would do the, the fibro scan, I think. Uh, we would never, never, never suspect any problem with this, this patient. So uh, what you see here now, it's, it's a really normal, nice uh, uh, liver stiffness. 4.6 kilopascal is just fine. Uh, what you see, by the way, is that indeed the cup value shows um, a number now for, for the fatty liver. And uh, also, the uh, cutoff values are not yet completely settled, but remember, 400 is the upper detection limit. This is really S3. It is full-blown steatosis. And you see it also in the ultrasound. What we have learned in the, in the last months or so, and it's still open, but uh, first, of course, we learn, and as you know, Ramon, that's still in the controversy in the hepatology field, whether uh, steatosis really is the uh, big and dangerous precursor, we don't actually know. But we have learned that uh, it responds well to detoxification. So it goes down if you detoxify the people. So it's, a, for instance, in this patient, it would be a nice follow-up marker to follow up uh, mm -hmm. because the stiffness is normal and the transaminases were almost normal. So at least you can tell the patient, yes, you, you improved metabolic That's And of course, uh, we would rule out here any fibrosis. So the patient can be safe. This, <clears throat> this case uh, reveals very clearly how variable are patients in terms of development of fibrosis. These two patients drank similarly amount of alcohol for many years. One have a cirrhosis and, have, and the other one has not significant fibrosis. So there are many aspects, many environmental factors and genetic factors that can influence that. And we need more research to identify patients at higher risk to develop severe fibrosis. Uh, I don't know if we have time for the third case or you want to go because I see a lot of questions. I think, yeah, I think it would be a great time now to, to move directly to the question and answer sessions, which will be the last one of this webinar. So uh, again, we have received many questions and thank you to all participants for sending these questions. Uh, we'll 
we'll do our best to address most of them. Um, we will start by the by the first question, and maybe I will um, let you answer uh, directly. So the first question sent by our participants is uh, how long uh, how long should a patient abstain from alcohol before a fibro scan? Is there a recommendation? No, no uh, in the field of alcohol, it's not so easy to patients with addiction to say, please, can you stop drinking for one day, one day before? Ideally, if we want to be pure and to identify only fibrosis and not the inflammation and the uh, associated, ideally, they should be a couple of days without drinking. But in real life, sometimes this is difficult because patients, even some patients develop withdrawal syndrome if they stop drinking. So one thing is the deal, stop drinking one or two days. But in real life, in my experience, sometimes it's difficult. I fully agree. That's the daily life. They come and they drink. And sometimes the drinking is not the issue, actually, especially. So, so but the question is actually how long should they abstain uh, to give at least a rough estimate? I mean, uh, it depends a little bit, of course, how um, pronounced the inflammation is, how, how elevated the transaminases are. So remember this female patient that I mentioned with 500 almost, that took about two weeks. Uh, so most patients within five, six, seven days are fine. Okay, thank you. So uh, it leads us to the second question. So you probably answered it already in your presentation. How to interpret stiffness value when AST level exceeds normal range? Are there adjusted cutoffs? Yeah, I hope I could answer it. Hopefully with the multicenter study we had now. So we, we use them now, the inflammation adapted cutoff values and uh, 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 so, so yes, I would do it like that. Question number three, uh, and we, are, we have received several questions on that topic. What would be the influence of alcohol uh, on the stiffness value when you scan a patient with chronic hepatitis C? Well, I, I will <laughs> highlight two questions. Number one, they are both causes of liver disease. They help each other, they're synergistic. If you have hepatitis C and you abuse an alcohol, you're more likely to develop cirrhosis. So a chronic alcohol consumption increases your chances to develop fibrosis. And then acutely, the same that happens with a person with a pure alcoholic liver disease. You have been drinking the last days, you can have more inflammation and then overestimate the degree of fibrosis. This is the two aspects that I will highlight in this so interesting would question. Would you recommend again to use your adjusted yes, cutoffs? You just yes. as Suleiman said, you can apply the algorithm and maybe a small comment uh, there are many other c confounding uh, factors. I mentioned briefly heart failure. Sometimes a mask, people don't know that they have it. So what I just want to mention briefly, because many people are confused and they say, oh, it's getting now very complicated. No, if your stiffness is high in the patient, you don't even care too much what are the factors. It should come down. That is the best. And uh, so uh, you have to consider many other things. That's why the algorithm, including ultrasound, including lab tests. Thank you. Question number four. Are the recently updated Baveno 6 guidelines applicable in also in patients with alcoholic liver disease? You can show the next slide. Well, probably uh, I will pass to Sebastian because he's more an expert on fiber scanning and in this. Um, Sebastian, yeah. you can answer that. So, I mean, I have not uh, participated in the Bavena conference, uh, but I know the data. And as you may know, uh, it's a full panel of very nicely configured criteria, also actually for the future, the, the homeworks we still have to do. And with regard to non-invasive tests, including FibroScan, um, there are some agreements, such as the one that you see now on the slide, that of course uh, we would fully agree, I mentioned it briefly also, but um, uh, there are some cutoff values, like the one that you see now, uh, where I would say, yes, they're fine. I would in general agree, like they, they mentioned, if you are less than 10 kilopascal uh, and you have no other signs, I would now more precisely say if you have normal transaminase levels, if you don't have uh, pathologies in the ultrasound, then you can be quite sure to rule out uh, compensated cirrhosis. Um, I hope I could make a little bit of point that with the cutoff, adapted values uh, and with the ultrasound you can even more precise. They are quite rough at the moment, the Baveno criteria, so they have 
like I think 15 kilopascal uh, to rule in um, uh, 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 the rule in cirrhosis. Uh, so I think we uh, there there will be still some discussion going on. Yeah, yeah? But in general, I would I would agree with these criteria. Uh, question number five, you mentioned that there, is, there are scarce data for the time being on CAP, but what would be the benefit of CAP uh, for you in your daily basis when you monitor alcoholic patients? I can tell more a clinical thing and maybe yeah. you can talk more about um, the CAP because you have more experience. But basically, this is the first stage of alcoholic liver disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, a, as a doctor, the earlier you capture a disease, the better. So there is no question that if you, you have a drinker, you have a steatosis, the first step of a disease is a liver disease. There's not much data showing that this pure steatosis in the absence of steatopatitis can deteriorate your outcome and it can impact your life. But to be honest, to detect a disease at the earlier stages is one of the main aims in medicine. And I will never uh, underestimate the usefulness of CAP in any disease, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, I fully agree. What I maybe should mention here, uh, in, indeed, I think thanks to the non-invasive techniques, we lack a little bit data still. Mm -hmm. uh, the recruitment is difficult. I would therefore really invite everybody, um, if he can contribute, to contribute to our multicenter study on CAP, on alcohol liver disease. So far, um, it looks in the preliminary data uh, that we have an excellent correlation with uh, ste histological steatosis. We also know that after detoxification, it comes down. Uh, what is still not really settled, how long it takes, and, uh, and there's also some acute interferences we still have to, to learn more. And I should maybe mention briefly, there is some observation in some patients that, uh, also other liver diseases, that CUP may even get up during the cure of the liver disease. So there's still some surprises that we will see in the next years. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, some questions here that the audience yes, yes, nicely are keeping up busy and thank you for sending you these yes, questions. Uh, there is one, maybe uh, I would like to, to start maybe that this one, a very specific one uh, concerning uh, is that any evidence that the rate of change of stiffness and or cap measurement provides important diagnostic information on the level of alcoholic liver disease? Yeah, but I think that is a question that ref I hope I could answer this already with our first interventional algorithm. Yes, of course. If you uh, ask your patient to abstain from alcohol and you remeasure the patient after maybe two weeks, I know that is sometimes a log logistical problem for many reasons. But if you do that, you have a much better performance of the fibro scan. You don't have to ask him to do that if he doesn't have elevated transaminase levels, then you don't have yeah. to do that. I think alcoholic liver disease is different from any other liver disease. You cannot get rid in one day of hepatitis B or C. You cannot lose or decrease your BMI by 20 points in 24 days. <coughs> but you can stop drinking today and tomorrow you're not drinking anymore. So the variations and the cause and the presence of the cause are amazing in these patients. Patients are so sometimes after a visit get scared, stop drinking, the fiber scan decreases, then increases. I think fiber scan in the monitoring of the addiction of, of the um, alcohol intake could be very useful once we have more data. I think much more useful of uh, other more lineal or the more stable diseases like hepatitis C or NAFLD, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, another question now also very specific concerning a patient Obese patient with non cirrhosis, a male score at 12, still drinking but not heavily. Fibroscan reading is constantly at 75 kilopascal, which is the upper, uh, upper range of, of measurements. Is it normal based on your experience and what does it mean for my patient? So, may I repeat to really understand the question? So, it's obese patient with non cirrhosis. Yes a melt of 12, drinking, and he has 75 kilopascal. He has full-blown cirrhosis. I don't know with, with, with what probe it was measured. Was it XL probe? You know, Probably, there are some yes. differences. Mm. But this is a full-blown, uh, uh, very stiff liver. He should not <laughs> drink, and I'm not uh, a saint sometimes. You know, we sometimes admit it, but this patient is very at risk, and 
I don't know more details about the patient, but he will progress more with these risk factors mm -hmm. and it will not be good. Yeah, I, I fully agree. It's uh, nearly to say that a patient with a male of 12 with an advanced cirrhosis, they cannot drink at all. It progresses the liver disease, it increases portal pressure, it favors liver failure, it favors hepatocellular carcinoma, and also most importantly, you never will be accepted in a transplant list. So I think it's mandatory for this patient, regardless of the fibro scan, to talk to him, to motivate, to do a motivation interview with him, and to send to an addiction therapist to try to, to get him to stop drinking. Okay, but is this something common? I mean, you mean 10 measurements consistently with 75 kPa? It's, it's, it's a short measurement, and mm -hmm. what I should maybe add, uh, and, and uh, Roman is absolutely right, mm -hmm. here we have a clear case, we don't mm -hmm. need the fibroscan actually. But if we discuss it, yes, do, let's say the patient would have 30 kilopascal, mm -hmm. so it would be also full blown cirrhosis. We see the, the more they progress, the more rapidly it will go. And that is actually what we will see with the fibroscan now. To, to increase from, from 5 to 8 will maybe take 5 years, but from 30 to 60 it can take half a year. And okay. if you continue to drink, it will be much faster. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe a last question, because we are running uh, out of time. Um, we have, a, a, again, a question on CAP. Uh, I mean, a, a very specific question. We know that they are not, for the time being, published cutoff. But the question is, are there CAP results in decibel meter helpful to stage steatosis in alcoholic liver disease? How do you? How would you use it in your regular daily practice? Yeah, the thing is, as I mentioned briefly, we learn that um, the cut off values, at least from our unit and the centers that contributed to that, uh, are a little bit different from the one published in Nash. Okay. So I cannot really say uh, why is this and and so on. Um, on the on the other side, I also mentioned that there other interfering factors that we have to learn about. The only thing I know for sure now is, um, for me, the liver stiffness is actually has a more higher priority. This is the more dangerous factor. But if you have a normal stiffness and you want to follow up with the patient something that can be objectified, CAP would be a good parameter to choose. If, uh, if, if of course I should add, if the lab tests are not doing it, likewise, of course, we should mention that. Okay, well, thank you. I think it's time now to conclude uh, this webinar. I would like again to thank you, uh, both of you, for uh, being with us Pleasure. tonight. I would like also to thank you, the participants connected. Thank you. I would like to add as well that the replay version of this webinar will be available on, the, on our website okay, very soon, probably uh, in, a, in the next few days. You have on the chat right now the link to access the Ecosense TV where you will be able to see again this replay version. It's time again for me to, to thank you again and to uh, hopefully we'll see each other for the next webinar. So thank you again and good evening. Hi everybody. Hi.